songs, where the focus of the, of the song was on your submission to God. Did you notice that? And if you look in your bulletin, if you hadn't noticed it yet, go ahead and have a look. And you will note and see that the songs in this song service focus on you saying to God, I submit to you whatever you say. What I want to do in this morning's sermon is to confront the part of our heart that doesn't mean it. What I think the Scripture is doing this morning is encouraging us to come to terms with the fact that we don't really want to listen to God. Not really. Not really. And there's, this, there's, there's stuff that God says that we want to hear, like, I love you. Who doesn't want to hear that? And I want to save your soul. And who doesn't want to hear that? And I want you to die on the cross. And Gosh, who wants to hear that? Right? So we sang, have thy own way, Lord, have thy own way. But there's a part of our heart that really means, have mine own way, Lord, have mine own way. Don't care who makes pottery, just give me my say. Mold me and make me after my will. Give me why I want or I will yell. We sang, sweet will of God, still fold me closer, but what we really, part of our heart really meant was, hey, will of God, adjust yourself to mine until I am wholly inventing thee. Oh, will of God, still fold around me till I get everything I want from thee. We sang, Lord, reign in me, but what, we, what a part of us meant was, Lord, reign beside me. Give me your power, give me all my dreams. In less than an hour, you are the Lord of all I want. So won't you let me reign again? It's ugly. It's ugly. And I hope that as we follow Christ, these scales are falling away. But if I honestly assess my own heart, and maybe I'm the only one in here who sings songs like this, but if I honestly assess my own heart, there is a part of me that hears the call of God and says, I want salvation, not discipleship. I want to go to heaven. I don't want to go through death to get there. I want you to redeem me, and I want you, God, to arrange my life so that it's pleasant and good, and I get what I want out of life. But today we come to terms with the truth that Jesus doesn't just call us to glory. Oh, He does. He calls us to glory. A glory and a beauty that we could never discover on our own. A glorious wonder and a future and a hope. But the path there, I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, I only suggest that perhaps we sing those songs in our hearts, that a part of us wants that to be what we get to sing, because so often the will of God looks like this. And not just for Him either. Uh, in our reading for this week, we've already passed it, but the passage that comes immediately before our reading for this week includes this, and he said, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world, forfeits himself? And he's calling us to something there, isn't he? And honestly, we don't want it. We hear that and go, give me baptism, not the cross. You know, give me the Lord's Supper, not the suffering of fools. I don't want to have to forgive. I don't want to have to bear trouble. I don't want to have to temper my own anger. I don't want to do any of the things that the suffering Christ Jesus is calling me to do is going to call me to do. I don't want that. In fact, very often, Jesus' disciples don't even understand it. And if you look in the text, and it's not surprising, in fairness to them, it's not surprising. We live on this side of Easter, this side of resurrection. And because of that, we have all sorts of categories and terms and understandings where we can look back on Jesus' call and we can say, okay, well, what that meant was this. And they didn't have any of that. And so when they hear him call them to a cross, it's no surprise that that just went right over their heads. 
But I think very often, even on this side of Easter, we'll hear it and it'll go... We'll hear Jesus' call to the cross and we'll be like, well, oh, I'm coming to church. I'm taking the Lord's Supper. I was baptized. I sing sometimes. So, I mean, I'm, I'm good. And that jerk at work re- re- encounters a jerk in me all the time. By the way, I'm obviously projecting because I run into Kylie and Karen and I don't have a jerk at work. But, uh, you know, that, that, that person who mistreats me gets mistreated right back. Why? Because it's going, Phew. There is a call to discipleship. And there is a call to discipleship that is, in fact, a call to glory. A mysterious, wondrous glory. This is the story of the transfiguration. After these things, he went up with Peter, John, and James. And he went up on the mountain to pray. And he was praying. His appearance of his face was altered. His clothes became dazzling white. And behold, two men were talking with him, Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke to him about his his departure. Which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Even in the middle of the glory. Even at the central point of the most glorious moment that we get to see in Jesus. There's discussion of departure. There's conversation about cross. It never leaves. The glory that we're being led to. And I'm, you know, I'll be honest with you, why Jesus decided for a moment to be a light bulb? I mean, this is a weird thing. You know, there, there are lots of, uh, lots of sermons about the, about the uh, transfiguration that will talk about how we go up on the mountaintop and we have the mountaintop spiritual experience, but then we have to come down and at the foot of the mountain is the demoniac waiting for us. We've got to get to work. And that's, I think those are fine sermons, but I, I do think that they make this moment less strange because this is a weird one. This odd, frightening, terrifying moment I think is unique to history. You know, I don't think we really have an analogous experience to this ever. Except to read it and to see it, to encounter it in the Scriptures, and to wrestle with the wonder of it. What is happening here? What is that thing? I think this is the moment when Jesus stands there as Son of God. That there's no doubt about what they're looking at when they're dealing with this. Why? Peter gets so thrown for a loop. It's really good to be here. We should build these houses. We should do this, okay? Because we can build one for him, and one for him, and one for you, you know, because you're obviously in the top three. You know, this is, this is a wondrous moment of oddity where you encounter God and he is strange. But oh, is he beautiful, right? And those two representatives there, Moses and Elijah, what are they there for? They represent all of the work that God has done up to this point. The lawmaker and the, the head of the prophets, the headwater of prophet, the one who, who shows what prophet's going to look like. Those two come. And what are they doing with Jesus? They're talking about cross. This glorious, beautiful person. Don't you want to be like Him? Wouldn't it great, be great to be glorious? And I'm sure that I would want to be phosphorus. I don't know whether I want that or not, because I think it would be weird. But oh, I would love to grab people's attention, grab their eye, grab their affection and their love, their admiration. I, I want that. And I'm not talking about some kind of narcissistic stage, uh, stage yearning. I mean as human person. I think all of us want this. We want the attention of others. We want them to care what we feel and think. And we want them to be drawn to us. We want to matter to people. We want to be glorious in other people's lives. We want to be loved. We want to be like that. Because they couldn't take their eyes off of Him. They were falling asleep and He woke them up. I can tell you, as someone who loves sleep, that's hard to do to me. You know, I bet it was tough to do to them. 
But boy, they are, I mean, again, probably another reason Peter's talking like a crazy person. You know, they are drawn to him. And don't you want that too? He is, uh, and I'm sorry, I already have camped on this, what I meant to do. Moses and Elijah appeared to them and spoke about his departure, about his departure. What Jesus has done and is doing in the gospel is he is, uh, he is showing us, he is showing us a way The cross is not just sacrifice that He does so that I don't have to die. The cross is calling. Calling to a particular way of living in this world. It is is the glory of Jesus. It's so attractive. The slow suffering death But what this is, is a way that has been set before us. A path that we should follow. That we should go down Jesus' way. That's why He says, if anyone comes after Me, they've got to take up the cross. You know, He's not going to the cross by Himself. This is a way that... And we want, that, we want to follow that way when it looks beautiful, but when it looks hard. And it always looks hard eventually I mean not always I mean the the call that begins most of us don't begin with the hard stuff but if you follow him long enough and you pay attention to his teachings you're gonna encounter the places where you have to die the scary parts up there the transfiguration on the mountain a cloud came and hid Moses and Elijah and Jesus from them in fact it enveloped all six I suppose of the people who were standing on that mountaintop It says the disciples were afraid when the cloud came. And a voice came out of the cloud that says, This is my Son, my Chosen One. Listen to Him. And folks, the truth is that can be so hard because He says stuff like this. Can you read that or is the font too small? Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. Lend, expecting nothing in return. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Let what you say be simply yes or no, and anything that comes from that is e- comes beyond that is evil. You therefore must be perfect, as your heavenly Father is perfect. He says such challenging things. And when you deal with an enemy the way that He expects you to deal with an enemy, when you deal with problems the way He expects you to deal with problems, It's going to feel like dying. And that's what he means when he says take up the cross. His way is not hard when he's telling you that you're loved. His way is not hard when he comes with his comfort to lift your soul from the dark place you find yourself. His way is not hard when he comes with his forgiveness. But this is the cross. And this is hard. And this is what he expects. But the truth is, it is so hard for us to hear it. And when we don't hear it, I think we lose power. When Jesus came down off the mountain, the next day He came down off the mountain and a great crowd met Him. And behold, a man from the crowd cried out, Teacher, I beg you to look at my son, for he's only a child. And behold, a spirit seizes him and suddenly he cries out and it convulses him so that he foams at the mouth and it shatters him. And it will hardly leave him. I begged your disciples to cast it out. But they could not. You remember that it is in this exact same chapter. You read about it last week that He sent them out. And when He sent them out, what authority did He give them? The authority to deal with rascals like these. And it's interesting, in the other, in the other uh, Gospels, Jesus kind of says things that suggest, okay, well, this was a really tough demon. 
You know, then this was really hard. It only comes out by fasting and prayer or something like that. Luke doesn't address that. Luke leaves that part out of the story. And if you have Matthew and Mark, you might bleed it in. But if you don't, what would you assume based on the way Luke's telling the story? There's something wrong with the disciples. Something's gone wrong here. A thing for which they had authority appears to be gone. A power that they had been, re- that, that they had been granted, they aren't able to utilize. What's going on here? And this is multiplied by Jesus' answer. Which, this, is, this really has struck me this week. It's been hard on me. Because I imagine myself in the role of the Father going and talking to Jesus and saying, please help my kid. What if I heard this? Oh, faithless and twisted generation. That word twisted uh, is perverse. You perverts, he says. You twisted generation. How long am I to be with you and bear with you? Bring me your son. And now, I suspect that cry isn't directed at the dad. I think it's probably at the disciples. But man, is that ever hard. And Jesus just sounds irritated, doesn't he? Oh, faithless, twisted generation. He sounds irritated. By the way, if you Google irritated Jesus, do you know what you see? This. (laughs) Because no one can imagine it. Irritated Jesus doesn't make sense. But doesn't he sound irritated? How long do I have to be with you and bear with you? You know, I've read a ton of scholars looking at this, trying to figure out what they were talking about. Do you know what the scholars do? Skip it. (laughs) They don't deal with this at all because I don't think anybody really knows what to do with this. It, It sounds like he's complaining. He sounds like he's giving voice to irritation, which is something he kind of teaches against. What on earth is he doing? I actually called a couple of scholars. That's how bothered I was by this. And one of them told me that what he thought this is is that, uh, that the, the emphasis is on the, the short time. You know, that he's about to run out of time and he doesn't have much longer to teach this stuff and they're not getting it. The other guy I talked to didn't buy it. He says, no, this, it sounds irritated. Have you ever talked firmly with your child as a disciplinary choice? Calling them to wake up? You know, this is, a, this is a hard word from Jesus. But it's one that the disciples need because their ears have filled in. Remember, Jesus asked them, who do people say that I am? And they say, you're the Christ. You're the Christ of God. And He says, no, you can't tell anybody that. Because you don't get it. You don't know what Christ of God means. I'm going to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to get arrested. I'm going to get flogged. And I'm going to get crucified. And the third day I'm coming back. And then he goes and says, if anyone wants to follow me, he's got to take up his cross. They've been hearing all that. Why couldn't they cast out the demon? Because they've been hearing all that. And they're thrown back on their heels. Have you ever been thrown back on your heels by a demand of Christ Jesus? If the answer to that is no, then you're either not reading your Scripture enough or you're not paying enough attention to your life because He will throw you into a place where you're uncomfortable. If you're listening to Him, He will make demands on you that will sound like the cross. And when we don't listen, the power of God is reduced in our lives. The strength that we might have had is not ours. You have to be faithful in the hard moment when the hard word comes if you want to be able to be champion over the demons. And get this. This is Jesus has cast out the demon and the people are all marveling about it. And while they were marveling at everything He was doing, Jesus said to the disciples, let these words sink into your ears. I think the reading we had is, listen carefully to this. That's the literal Greek. Let these words sink into your ears. The Son of Man is about to be delivered into the hands of men. He said, you really need to hear this. If you don't hear this, if you won't pay attention to this, you're going to miss the whole program. 
And it is very possible to be a Christian who misses discipleship. To walk with Him and refuse to hear Him. You'll know you're doing that when you hear the hard word from Jesus and you don't listen. And you say, no. Forgive that person. You don't know how hard what you just asked me to do is. Yes, He does. Yes, He does. Love that person. They're horrible. So are you. Love that person. He doesn't ask. He tells. And when He tells, we need to, be, we need to let these words sink into our ears that they might then sink down into our hearts. Because the transformation we desire, the glory we want comes from walking the hard path with Jesus. It comes from the Word of God settling into our heart to kill us that we might live. This is how we do it. But note this, but they did not understand this saying. Like, is this the first time they've heard it? Oh, it's just a couple of days ago. You know, three days after he said those things, he went up on the mountain, the next day he comes down. Four days! They've already heard it. But they just don't get it. And in fairness to them, I know, I live post-Easter. I know I do. I live after the resurrection. I know I do. I can see it a lot easier than they can. But I still wonder at this. It was concealed from them so that they might not perceive it. And they were afraid to ask him about this saying. They just they couldn't understand. What are you talking about, Lord? But their fear from asking him, and, and the, they don't understand. Folks, those are threats to us. They are real dangers that we should hear the word of God and ignore it. That we should hear the word of God and not hear it. You didn't mean that. I'm already saved. I don't need to do that to experience salvation. Maybe you get to go to heaven, but to experience salvation, yes, you do. To live with the Christ is to be alive. To reject what He has to say is to be dead. He raises the dead by His words. And discipleship is life. The way of the cross Paradoxically, the way to die is the way to live. And that's what Jesus has brought to us. So I have three quick words, maybe four, and we're done. When we do not listen, we cannot hear. Now this is very important. If you want to follow Jesus, you need to listen to Him daily. He says, take up the cross daily. You need to be hearing His words every day or you won't do it. Because you won't hear that to which you are not listening. Even when we do listen, it is hard to hear. And and we've got to come to terms with that. If we don't acknowledge this truth, that it is very hard to hear the demands of the Christ then we'll treat them like they're easy. And what we mean by that is, we don't really have to do them. That's not true. You were called into a particular kind of living, a particular way of being alive, which is constant self-death. And so when you're going to hear that, you need to approach hearing Jesus, understanding that you were biased against Him in the first place. The things that he says, the fallen heart does not want to do. And if you're going to be able to hear him, it's going to be by his power, but your cooperation is to acknowledge that I'm going to hear stuff I don't like, and I've got to keep listening. When he says things that we don't want to hear, it is hard to listen or hear. And he says a lot of things we don't want to hear. That's the truth of discipleship. We have to learn. We, it, it, following Jesus is, is an acquired taste. And He helps us to acquire it. 
But boy, it's hard. And you see in the disciples, and we'll see next week, <laughs> what it looks like when you don't listen. What kind of person are you? He is calling us to come walk with Him and to listen to Him. And folks, we need to pay most attention when we want to pay least. We need to be listening to the hard call of Jesus because those things that look the most like death are in fact the most life-giving. The place where He calls you to do something, that if I do that, that'll be awful. That's where you'll find yourself most fully alive because that's the way of the cross. One last thing. It is only by His Word that we become anything more than what we are. If you are content to stay as you are, then it's not important to listen. If you're pleased with the way things are in every aspect of your life, good. Keep coming to church. Keep going through the motions. And the rest of us will keep putting up with you. But if you want to be more, listen to the Christ. Really listen. Ask for His help that you might hear. Because that glory that you're after is a deafening thing if you only seek the glory. The only way to the glory is by the path of the cross. By doing the hard teachings of the Christ. That's how we find our way home. How are you doing with this? Are you listening? If you look into your own life and you say, man, I need a hearing aid. There's no shame in that. We all struggle with this. But if you need the prayers of the saints, let us know. And if you're not following the way of Christ, I've probably done the best advertisement for it today than I'll ever do. Because it's true. It's hard. It's difficult. It's challenging. And it looks like death. And it's the best way of life that there is. And if you haven't started following Him, today's the day to start. And if you came to this place bearing burdens that have nothing to do with what I've talked about, I'm sorry that your burdens haven't been, haven't been touched and blessed. But this church wants to bless you. And we want to pray for you. If this morning you're subject to the invitation of the Christ, you let us know right now while we stand and sing. Jesus, you